Okay, we are in Jeremiah 36 today. The title is The Burning Scroll because later on in this chapter, the king does not want to hear the truth of God. And so he seizes the scroll that it's written on and he burns it. But God's word does not come back void. God inspires Jeremiah to rewrite the scroll. And so most likely uh, somewhere in the book of Jeremiah, there's 52 chapters. Likely there was at one point about that many scrolls attributed to Jeremiah. And most likely one of those scrolls was the one that, that was burned here in Jeremiah 36. We don't know exactly which one. And you know already that Jeremiah is very redundant in some ways that he says the same thing many times in many ways and so it's hard to know exactly which scroll was burned but Jeremiah 36 is unique because we really have a view it's the best example in the Bible of that process we all wonder about about God communicating to human beings and then human beings writing that down, what God communicated, what, which is what the Bible is. Most time we get the result, but here we get a story telling us about the process. And so I have been familiar with Jeremiah. I've been eagerly anticipating it from the day one starting seminary. They talked about Jeremiah 36 because we get to see this process of Bible transmission. And it is, it, it is a big subject and uh, challenging in some ways because it's so big, but there's a lot of different ways things went from the mouth of God into a human and out to be written and then copied and passed to us to give us the Bible. It's a fascinating, we take it for granted, we reach over and we pick up a Bible and <coughs> We just take it as it is, but there was thousands of years have gone into that book. We know of at least at least 40 different human authors, and that is only the ones that are named. Uh, they are the exception. Many more of the human authors are unnamed than are named in the Bible. Now, tradition tells us this person wrote this and this person wrote this, but there's very few named authors in, in most of the Bible books. The Bible was written over about 1,600 years, 1,600 years, at least 40 different authors, numerous untold people had a hand in it, whether it be the original person that told the word of God, spoke it out loud, whether it be a simple person who heard what was spoken and wrote it on, uh, wrote it down on a scroll, whether it be people who have collected, you know, we have the book of Psalms, and that's like saying the book of songs, and we have 150 different poems and songs there, and they did not, they were not created the first one written was Psalm 1, and the second was Psalm 2 all the way through Psalm 50. They were written over, who knows, innumerable amount of time. Some of them are very old. Some of them are a lot younger. Somebody at some point collected all those poems and put them together, uh, and then they began to be copied together. At some point, they were probably written, and they were all in different places and different authors. Some of those have a named author, and many don't. Uh, it's just God has been working for thousands of years to give us this Bible study today. Uh, and it's our job to use good, consistent uh, tools to kind of unpack it and understand it. But the biggest tool that we can use, I, in my opinion, to know what God says to us is to be consistent. 
The, the Bible is way too big and way too complex for anybody to think that they can master it. And that, that any human being can process all that information and know what God says about everything. And I think that's on purpose. I think, one, God is so big, nobody can really know everything about God. But two, he did it this way on purpose so that we would have to study all the time, all our life, so that we saturate ourselves with the Word of God. And some of it we get, and some of it just washes over us, and we don't hear something. And you know, if you've done any Bible reading, any consistent Bible reading, you will read a passage that you have read 150 times, and you'll see something that you've never seen before. And that's because God is alive. And God is speaking to us as we do this, whatever the electronic thing happens in our brain when we absorb the information and start processing it. God, that is God speaking to us. God breathed his breath into us and we became living beings. And he is speaking to us. And so anyway, I'm excited about uh, Jeremiah 36 for that reason because it is a kind of a snapshot of that process going on. Any thoughts, John? Not only is the authorship awesome, but the translation, the printing, you know, people give their lives when they translated the Bible or oh, yes. when they printed the Bible. Yes, that's right. A lot of, and especially for evangelicals, there is a, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, the Trail of Blood. Uh, the scarlet thread. I've heard it different different things, but it is what we would call the evangelical, which is what we believe. We believe an orthodox evangelical interpretation of the scriptures. And I believe there has always been that people who believe the evangelical perspective on things. And I, I guess I would say that as opposed to the Catholic Church and their, their interpretation of Scripture. Um, and there have been a lot of people, you know, Martin Luther, his whole big thing, the Reformation, was about the Bible, ultimately that. There were things about the Catholic Church that, that upset him, but the thing that Martin Luther could not tolerate was when Scripture was ignored or changed, or people, the institution of church would do something on an authority other than the Bible. And he said, I need to get the Bible into the hands of the believers to read for themselves, and he translated it into German. But the, even before Martin Th Luther, there have always been an evangelical perspective on an interpretation of the Word of God, and there have been many times in history, as you say, that people have been executed for, for their belief in that. Yes? Well, the Catholic Church believes that church tradition supersedes Scripture. Right. That scripture, in fact, is part of church tradition. So it would be co equal. It's important, but but what is more important, they wouldn't say more important than scripture, but I would say what they're saying is more important. That tradition and the way that we have interpreted the Bible in the past supersedes any interpretation of a straight read of it now, unless, of course, the institution, the church, decides to make a change and they want to reinterpret the scripture for themselves in a different way. All right? Hocus pocus, and the Bible is there to serve the Catholic church. That, that's my take on it, and I know Catholics would be offended by that. I, sometimes the truth is offensive. So anyway, don't want to beat on the Catholics. Cat, good, many good Catholics, many God-fearing Catholics 
All right, so let's look at Jeremiah chapter 36, the scroll read in the temple. As we know, we're back to Jehoiakim now, and I know we've jumped back and forth. Jehoiakim, it tells, it dates, uh, this is about 605, so we began our journey with Jeremiah. Jeremiah began speaking 627 B.C. during Josiah's reign. Early on, uh, halfway through Josiah's reign, this is 20 years later or so. Josiah has been dead about four or five years at this point. It's a big blow to everybody for Josiah. And now his second son, Jehoiakim, is king. And Jehoiakim was king for 11 years. Uh, his brother had briefly been king. Jehoiahaz, for about three months, uh, was taken Necho, the king of the Pharaoh of Egypt, had killed Josiah and had appointed Jehoiahaz king. Came back three months later and took him prisoner to Egypt and appointed Jehoiakim king. And Jehoiakim was um, not a good king. Uh, he was a little bit oblivious. He was very excited to be king and be powerful. He did a lot of building projects but really gave no attention to the spiritual needs of the people. At some point, he was, he was loyal to Egypt and Necho, Pharaoh Necho. Then he switched allegiance to Nebuchadnezzar. And then at some point, then, and started paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, then at some point, I think he began, he stopped paying tribute and brought on the first siege. But that's all in the future now. We have seen at various times that Jeremiah's message was very unpopular with the kings because the kings were trying to do their own thing, whether it was Jehoiakim and kind of ignore spiritual needs and ignore all this and make lots of buildings, you know, make a great palace, or it was Zedekiah who was trying to fight against Babylon. You know, different ones did different things. They did not like Jeremiah, we know Jeremiah represented the word of God to, he, to those kings. He was just a meddler, and he was negative. He was always negative, always saying, God's going to spank us all, you know. Have something, they said, you know, say something positive. Well, he was forbidden to go to the temple, uh, Solomon's temple, uh, the, the center of the Jewish religion. So that's the way we find things in verse 1. Now it came to pass, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. And that would be 604 to 605 B.C. And the reason we say from 4 to 5 is because their calendar is different than ours. And so it depends on where it fell on their calendar. Uh, they, we would call that one year but on their calendar it would be parts of two years anyway this word came to jeremiah from yahweh saying take a scroll of a book you know paper paper and pencil and write on it all the words that i have spoken to you against israel against judah against all the nations from the day i spoke to you from the days of Josiah even to this day. So 20 some years of prophecies, I want you to begin recording these. So I would say we don't have this anymore because this gets, what he writes down here initially gets burned by Jehoiakim. Then he rewrites it as we'll see in this chapter. He dictates it again and rewrites all of it. So we have the second version of the, pro at least the second version of the prophecies that were destroyed. Yes. That, that might be why Jeremiah is so mixed up. That's a, that's a part of it. That certainly. Uh, and, and so I, you know, I don't know if he had notes. I don't know if he remembered. I don't know if God re-inspired him what to say, but it, it really could explain why it's disordered. And, you know, reflecting back, you're going to remember things that you have said, and then you'll remember another time when you said something similar, and so you do another scroll for that one, and, 
and so forth. So it, it would explain a lot. Uh, and so, again, we don't know exactly which of the things that we have are being referred to here, or if they are one fragment, because he's still, at 605, he still has 20, 22 years, 23 years of prophecy. So he's only about halfway through. So, so we could, some of what we have could be what it's referred to. We just don't know exactly, you know, what prophecies, uh, what, we would like it if he said, go back and inspire what will someday be Jeremiah 1 through Jeremiah 25. You know, that would be helpful to us, but obviously, you know, chap the chapters and verses are only about 500 years old. So this was long before chapters and verses. So we don't know exactly what he is referring to. So as I said, God began speaking to Jeremiah during the reign of Josiah, 627 B.C. This is the first record of the command to Jeremiah to compile his prophecies in written form. Now, we have 52 chapters. That's a big, long Bible book. But you know what? Jeremiah, let's say 27 uh, plus 18. Jeremiah prophesied for about 45 years. And so 52 would only be one chapter a year. Now, how long would it, how long would you have to talk to get a chapter? 20 minutes? 15 minutes? So you know Jeremiah said a lot more than what we have. He gave a lot more prophecies than what we have. Uh, but at some point, God said, this needs to be written down. Now what? It is interesting, talking about prophecies, if you go back to Elijah and Elisha, they came before Jeremiah. They came earlier in the kingship. And Elijah and Elisha are pretty important prophets, right? Would everybody agree that? Uh, but you know what? We have almost none of their prophecies. There is no chapter in Kings, uh, First Kings or Second Kings, that tell us prophecies, the things they said. We know a lot about their lives. We know a lot about the story of their lives. We know a lot of miraculous deeds they did. We know about Elijah confronting, uh, because of Ahab and Jezebel's sin, he confronted the, the 850 prophets, the prophets of Baal, and uh, what was it, the prophets of Asheroth, um, and had that big battle with them, that prophecy battle, and, and they were all executed after Many amazing deeds, but we don't know what they said. And m most likely, the reason we don't is because their message was for the, for the kings. They were sent to talk to the nobility. And that's not necessarily helpful to you and me uh, or to the people, to the common people of that time, those prophecies, because most of us aren't going to rule kings, kingdoms. Um, but Jeremiah's prophecy, as we've gone through, you know, he has said, turn from, from the pagan deities and, and the practices that just kind of slip in because all your neighbors are doing one thing that is different than your covenant with God. And you tend to pick up those things that your neighbors do. And you begin to do them. That's, you, your thinking changes. You become worldly in your thinking. And so there's a lot of importance to you and me. So six, uh, 627 B.C. at 627 years and add, add uh, 2023 to that. And that would be 50, 650, 2,650 years later. The words of Jeremiah, the prophecies of Jeremiah, still are helpful to us to look in a mirror of Scripture and to see things that we are doing all this time later um, and that 
we need to turn back to God before it's too late. That still speaks. And so God said, these, I'm telling you stuff that is very important for your day, Jeremiah. The kings that you're talking to and the people you're talking to, they all need to hear it. But it also has value for faithful believers that are going to come later and as a message to be told to people that are in rebellion against God. Um, and we see that process here. And so this is the first record of that. This compilation of prophecies were mentioned earlier. Uh, Jeremiah in chapter 25 was getting prophecies to the prophets of Samaria. So that would be going back to, um, he was making a point about the way the, the kings in the northern kingdom of Israel had the prophets in the capital, which was Samaria. Um, and he said this to them. So I will bring on that land, northern kingdom of Israel, all my words which I have pronounced against it. So God had made prophecies uh, against Israel, and they had already come true by Jeremiah's time. All that is written in this book, which Jeremiah has prophesied concerning all the nations. So that was the first reference to Jeremiah writing down his prophecies. One purpose of recording these prophecies was so they could be read aloud to the people in that day. Uh, and, and we see in this story, Jeremiah is banned from going to the temple. So if the people at the temple are going to hear the words of God, it has to be written down and, and read. Now, I think it's funny, and it's always funny to me to say it because it's just kind of ironic. But in Jeremiah's day, writing things down and reading information to people was considered cutting-edge technology. You know how we struggle uh, with technology and it is frustrating to us and it just seems there we all recognize there's a lot of good in it, but it, we're wary because we didn't grow up with the technology. Well, the people in Jeremiah's day were that way about stuff being read off a piece of paper. They were from an oral tradition that where things were spoken. And when a person spoke, you also could read the person. And they were very good at reading the person that was speaking. Reading something off a piece of paper, you can't, to them, you can't look at a piece of paper and know something about it. It's, deceitful it was I, i'm speculating but that they would see that a little bit deceitful because you can't really make a value judgment against what the person is saying off a piece of paper so they were a little bit distrustful it was the cutting edge technology of their day uh, the hope was that the people would hear about every disaster threatened by god in all these um, prophecies against pagan nations and against Israel and against Judah and would turn from their wicked way. If the people would repent, and we know this because we went through, you know, thus far in up to about chapter 30, um, the first 30 chapters of Jeremiah is just, it's just rugged and difficult because God is, you know, kicking butt and taking names uh, in those. God promised to forgive their wickedness if they would repent. So why, why write it down? Well, in ver verse 3 it says this, It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversities which I pur purposed to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way. It's just another time to plead with the people and just read these scrolls and read these prophecies uh, and it will cause people to repent that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin it is God reaching out to people as the Bible is today God sending a letter 
sending a letter out to um, mankind, calling them back, telling them what they have to do in order to come back to God. So this is not codependency. God doesn't say, you know what, come on back and I'll forget everything you've done and we'll just call it even. No, he says, you know, every sin has to be paid for, but repent and come back to me. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on the scroll of a book, at the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of Yahweh, which he had spoken to him. It's not known whether Jeremiah recited all the prophecies from memory or read them from scrolls and notes that he had recorded earlier. Both views allow for God's superintendence. Okay? And I don't know exactly how God inspired the Bible. Um, I imagine it was done in various ways to various people. Um, but, but whether Jeremiah was going from memory and God was directly inspiring him as he did it, or whether he had written down notes or he had, he had written down thoughts on scrolls himself. Either way, God is superintending and watching that. In fact, in the book of Revelation, God told John to write down what he saw. Yeah, yeah. So that's what John saw. Yeah, that yeah. John was recording visions uh, that he had gotten. Um, and so, uh, and to me, this is an important thing. Most people, most believers, most Christians, people of faith, are okay with the idea of God superintending the writing of the Bible. But they tend to then, we know that God entrusted Scripture to people and that it was transmitted from people to people to people and it was written down and copied in hand for thousands of years and then finally into, changed into a printing press and printed. And so we're okay with him starting the process, but people think that God then went and took a nap on the scripture. And man, you know, the Muslims call us people of the book, Christians, but they believe that we have corrupted the word of God and bent it to our own needs. And I know, you know, human beings are capable of such things and that it no longer is the word of God. We, it's the word of Christian people. I believe all my years of study and learning, um, the more I learn, the more confident I am that God is alive and well and that God has superintended the Bible all the way into your mind. And that the book in the pew in front of you that God has preserved his word and watched it in translation and in transmission and that if you open that book and you open your heart to God and you read and think God um, you will hear read process the word of God I believe that that God has not let the Bible cut it loose and let it be corrupt. I do not believe that at all. I believe that's wishful thinking of people that do not want the Bible to have authority in their life. That's what I think that is. In John 14, 25, it said, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things, bring you to your remembrance of all things that I have said to you. In other words, this is not just a matter of God speaking one time and then allowing his word to be corrupted. That the Holy Spirit is working 
every time a person faithfully reads the Bible uh, to hear God speak, if they want to hear God speak, the Holy Spirit helps them to understand. And, you know, I, I don't want to oversimplify it. There's still work to be done, but, but God is managing. That's what I hear that verse saying. God is managing the Bible still, superintending it and watching it. Because why would God speak and then go silent and allow it to be man? Because, you know, God wasn't surprised that we were sinful. And God wouldn't be surprised that there would be people that would try to corrupt the Bible if they could. Why would he let that happen? What is the end game? God wants to be known. God wants to call man back. In verse 5, Jeremiah commanded Baruch, I'm confined. I cannot go to the house of Yahweh, to the temple. You go, therefore, and read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction the words of Yahweh in the hearing of the people in Yahweh's house on the day of fasting. You shall also read them in the hearing of all Judah who come from their cities. So day of fasting seems to be a special thing going on. Um, in times of trouble, there is precedent in, in, in the Bible for kings calling days of fasting on things. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah as they contemplated God's will. So Jehoshaphat did that. In Joel, you know, Joel is an, an end times prophecy. Uh, it is a, a prophecy of a great locust, um, the locust coming and eating everything. Consecrate a fast, you know, make a holy, set aside a holy day of fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of Yahweh your God and cry out to God. So uh, a day of fasting would be a day where people are coming to the temple and seeking God for answers. Um, and so most likely Jehoiakim as the rumblings of Nebuchadnezzar. I think it is right in this time. Originally, Nebuchadnezzar's daddy had been king of Babylon and had been the main general. His name was Nablo-Plazer. Somewhere right in this time, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the general of the army, and he got message that Nablo-Plazer had died, and he went back to... Babylon to make sure that he was the next king, that nobody grabbed his throne. Uh, and so, depending on when things were happening and how they were happening, it's possible that Jehoiakim had called a fast day. Now, that was a golden opportunity because people wanted to hear God speak. But there was a problem. Jeremiah was not allowed to go to the temple. So that's why he used this newfangled technology. Well, let me, let's write down what God wants people to know. And then anybody can read God's word. God does not have to send a prophet to Pleasant View Baptist Church today so that you can know what God wants to say to you, does he? He, because he has inspired men to write it down and we can read. And so my function is not to prophesy the word of God to you. It's already prophesied. My job is to make it clear and, and to help you apply it and think about it for yourself. Reading the scroll in verse 7, it may be that the people will present their supplication before the Lord. Their supplication, ask God for stuff. They'll pray to God 
for whatever is on their heart, and everyone will turn from his evil way, for great the for great is the anger and fury that Yahweh has pronounced against this people. Baruch, son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading from the book the words of Yahweh in Yahweh's house, in the temple, on the day of fasting. Now it came to pass. In the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king, king of Judah, in the ninth month, they proclaimed a fast before Yahweh and all the people in Jerusalem and all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem. A little more historical back down, background. And when I say historical background, usually that means from a source outside the Bible. Uh, from an archaeological source, we they have a collection called the Chronicles of the Chaldean Kings. In Babylon, they put things into stone. They recorded the deeds of the kings in stone. And so in this case, it may give us some background information from the Babylonian source. Uh, this is the Chronicles of the Chaldean Kings went from 626, about the time... Uh, that, that Jeremiah started prophesying till um, about 30 years after Je Jeremiah went off the scene. And this collection is now in the British Museum. It suggests that in the same month as the, fa the fast was called, that Nebuchadnezzar captured the city of Ascalon, a Judean city, and he plundered it. Very possibly, this fast, Jehoiakim called this fast to plead for deliverance from Babylon's harsh hand, from, the, from a city, a fortified city in Jerusalem had fallen to Nebuchadnezzar, and they were having a fast, which is just kind of neat that those things possibly were simultaneous. Um, in verse 10, it says, Then Baruch, back at the temple in Jerusalem, read from the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of Yahweh in the chamber of Gamaria, in the apartment or room of Gamaria, who was son of Shaphan. Now we've looked at the sons of Shaphan before. Uh, Shaphan was a scribe, I believe. Yeah, it says Shaphan the scribe. Um, in the upper court at the entry of the new gate of Yahweh's house in the hearing of the people. Um, let's see, I think I have a note on that. Yeah, Gamaria, like his brother ah, ah, Ikam, ah, Ahikam, not sure how that's pronounced. We had looked at him earlier. They supported Jeremiah and helped Jeremiah. I believe Jeremiah got arrested and it was Ahikam who said, you know, hold on. Um, let's not execute first and then ask questions later. Let's, um, I think he referred to a previous prophet who had come and they had executed him maybe in the time of Hezekiah or something. Anyway, he had defended Jeremiah. They had allowed Baruch, Baruch uh, to use and read, use his room and read to the people gathered in the courtyard. So, he needed permission to be there, and this family, the sons of Shaphan, helped him out. So, you know, nothing, word gets around on things. When Micaiah, son of Gamaria, son of Shaphan, heard all the words of Yahweh from the book, he then went down to the king's house, to the palace, <laughs> into the scribe's chamber, and there all the princes, these were the nobles, the leaders, were sitting. Elishma, Elishama, the scribe, uh, Deliah, son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, son of Akbor, Gamaria, son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, son of Hananiah, and all the princes were in this chamber. When Micaiah, when Micaiah declared to them all the words that he had heard from Baruch, when he described what Baruch had read in the scrolls, uh, in the hearing of the people, thus all the princes sent Jehudi, 
son of Nethaniah, son of Shelemiah, son of Cushi, to Baruch, saying, Take your hand, take in hand the scroll from which you read to the people, and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the scroll in his hand and came to them, these officials. They said to him, Sit down now and read it in our hearing. So Baruch read it in their hearing. And now it happened when they had heard all these words, all these prophecies of Jeremiah that God had given him. They looked in fear from one to another and said to Baruch, We will surely tell the king of all these words. They asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how did you write all these words at his instruction? And so we're going to stop there. That's a good place to stop um, in this story. So God told Jeremiah to write it down so it could be read to those people. But I also think, I've said this many times, I don't think Jeremiah, and I may be wrong, but I don't think in his prophetic gift, I don't think he saw us sitting here. 2,650 years later. I don't think he thought about us when he was telling all these things. But I do think God and the Holy Spirit did see us sitting here. I think, I mean, I truly, I the way I comprehend God is that everything is happening right now for God. And so we are having this Bible study simultaneously with Jeremiah giving his prophecies in one manner of, of thinking that from God's view, not, you know, not, we don't have any kind of vision like that, but, but God can see it all. And I think God said, I want the Bible to be written down. So not only these people in Judah can hear what is happening and hear the word of God and be offered repentance, but that that same offer can be made to people throughout time. Uh, and so I do think, I don't think the Apostle Paul had a vision of us reading his letters and, 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 and talking about them. But I think the Holy Spirit who inspired him did see us. I think we are intentional, part of God's intention. And I think it's very important. So anyway, God told him to write it down to tell those people, uh, uh, this fella, and I can't remember his name, Mariah, whatever his name was, heard it and went and told the important princes, the officials, uh, the captains. And they said, this is important. We need to hear it for ourselves. So they sent for Baruch, and he came in and read it again. And they said, the king needs to hear about this. And so that's where we're going to leave the story this week. Um, are there any questions or comments as we get ready to close? If, if they looked in fear at one another, it kind of indicates to me that they believed some of it. That's, that's what is, seems to be real clear in this passage, doesn't it? They were affected appropriately by it. They fear. I, I had my buddy in California uh, uh, communicated with me this week, asking me about uh, to translate a passage in Habakkuk 3 talking about the fear of the Lord. Um, and he said, is that being scared or is that being in awe? And I, you know, I said it really, it really depends. Um, it, the same word is used for an appropriate love and respect for God. It's the same word as Jacob feared that Esau was going to kill him. And I said, I believe that fear of God, the, the good fear, is actually recognizing how much greater God is than us, is a kind of fear, but it is a respectful fear. And thus we listen to God. We obey him because he's God. It's enough that God says that we don't have to be proven to our mind. We don't have to be punished if we don't do it. We want to do it because God said do it. That's enough. That is what the fear is supposed to be, and that is the fear that Jesus had. When Jesus come, you know, we saw Sunday in his temptation, 
in the wilderness, he deserved the things that Satan was offering. He had power to take those things for himself. He could have justified any of it. But if he did those things, what does it say in, in, in Philippians? Uh, he did not, he lowered himself and considered it robbery to reach out and take, you know, basically what was due him. And so he subordinated himself to the will of the Father, the greater plan of the Godhead to save mankind. And he knew that if he did not, subordinate himself to God, if he did not fear God appropriately, that we couldn't be saved. There wouldn't be a Messiah for us. Um, and so fear is the appropriate, good fear is the appropriate response to who God is. We are supposed to live our life in fear. Now that's not fear of punishment, that is subordination and a recognition that God is so much greater than us and he deserves our respect and our attention and our, he deserves the authority that he has in our life. And so I think, yeah, I think that's what they're saying here, um, that these men heard, when they heard of these prophecies, they're like, God is alive and well, and he's watching. And we are not free agents. We are not floating free, but we have a responsibility to the living God. So, yeah, I agree. I agree. They're hoping that the king will. So we know a little bit about Jehoiakim. Do you think Jehoiakim will have the same respect and fear? We'll see next week, won't we? Um, any other questions or comments? All right, well, let's end right there and, and, and say a prayer.